Alright, so in this uh, bonus video that I'm including with the series, I'm going to show you just a few more uh, extra features, ones that usually don't fall within the basics of ZBrush, but just some, some fun stuff you can utilize if you so wish to do. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you is how to actually record a movie within ZBrush, which can be a pretty useful function if you want to do something like um, time-lapse sculpting exercises or something like that. Because if you go do like maybe a practice sculpt for an hour and you want to show it off to your friends or something, nobody's going to want to sit there for an hour, obviously, um, and watch you sculpt. So you can actually time lapse that and export it to a seven minute video or so. And uh, so that way people can get a good idea of your sculpt, sculpting methods and um, how things work with it. So to show, show you how to do that, Go up here to the movie menu, right here. And you're going to open that up. You get a few options here. Uh, by default, modifiers will not be open, so it'll look like this. And to uh, get started, go ahead and open the modifiers menu. Now, uh, by default, this recording FPS and playback FPS will be set to 24 frames per second, which is fine and all. Um, that's uh, standard, so you can record at that. It won't give you anything, it won't give you any problems. Uh, and also by uh, default the skip menus and the on mouse buttons are highlighted and turned on. And uh, what those basically mean is uh, skip menus means it's going to record you um, only while you're sculpting and not while you're navigating through the menus. So if we want to keep recording while we're navigating through the menus, which also can be useful if you're if you're also doing a tutorial on your own or something you can just turn that button off and it'll record you anytime you're going around the menus or anything um, also on mouse it's pretty self-explanatory like skip menus it will only record whenever your mouse is pressed down whenever the cursor is pressed down and you're actively doing something um, so we are going to turn that off because we don't want any frames to skip Okay, so uh, up here, you see at the top here, um, before you start recording, I'm going to go ahead and set mine to 60 frames per second recording, and then I'll set the playback to 24. I found that to be a little bit smoother for my, for my uses. And to just get started, to simply get started, just click record like this. And you can see up here, it's recording. Now how um, ZBrush records is by recording it frame by frame. And um, this way it has an exporter that can export it to a, uh, a file that's, that you can use to edit later. But to give you smooth recordings, it'll record it frame by frame. So you can see we're just rotating around, doing whatever, zoom in and out, whatever. Just whatever, but we're recording right now okay so whenever you're finished with your recording you go back up here to movie and you'll see everything else is grayed out except for the pause button okay you have to pause it first before you can do anything else so you hit pause and now you have this pretty much stored in your clipboard your queue and um, if you want to go ahead and play it back you can just click play movie and it'll have a little previewer window pop up and show you the movie and it'll play it back for you it's pretty cool Okay, we'll skip ahead. And um, the other option you have is to export it, of course. Now, when you export it, it's going to open up. First, it's going to have the the um, save screen, what you want to save the file name as. We'll just leave it as the default. Oh, it looks like I already have that one there. But we'll just say test movie and save that. Maybe give it a second to work. And we'll go ahead and interrupt this process once it starts. Um, but once you get to save in the movie, and after you get past the file name screen, you'll get this compression settings uh, exporter dialog box thing here. And uh, by default, it's set, set to an H.264 codec, which is uh, really good for this kind of recording. And then we can set back the number of frames we want it to play back. 
well, we're going to leave it at 24 like we have in the original uh, settings in ZBrush. And uh, limit data rate, this is just going to affect uh, how, how much uh, of a quality movie goes out, but it doesn't have to be this high because it's going to take forever if you try to render it out this high. So I typically set mine to 400 because I tend to post them to YouTube and such, so you don't really need to be super high quality to, um, to get to post on YouTube or anything because it's not going to make a lot of difference. And then uh, you'll just have it down here. You'll set to your uh, quality level, and then you'll just click OK. And once you do that, it's going to play back the movie. And uh, you see that it has to go through the entirety of the movie to play it before it's it's technically exporting and playing it back for you at the same time so what that means is you cannot interrupt this process if you click off or if you click on this or try to click anywhere else it's just going to stop and it's going to interrupt it and say it, it failed to export it so don't click on anything while it's exporting it okay and that's pretty much how you export your movie and then you can just play it back with um, you can just play it back with QuickTime because it's in a .mov format. And you can see now we have our movie playing back. So pretty cool stuff. Very useful. Now if you want to record a time lapse video, you can go up here again to Movie. And uh, under the same menus, just click on Time Lapse and they'll start recording a time lapse for you. Now we can go ahead and move around do our same thing like we did before. We'll try to move a little bit slowly just so it knows. Just so I can show you a better example. Now that we've gone and done that, we'll just pause it again like we did before and we'll play it back. Oh, I think the old movie was actually still in the clipboard there. So whenever that happens, that's that's actually a good time to tell you this. If you already have a movie in the clipboard and you have and you hadn't deleted it before you started a new movie, it'll just add it on top of the other movie. It'll just uh, basically make it stand side by side with the other movie, and then it'll export it all as one movie. So for these reasons, we don't want that. So. At least you got to see me a mis be, see me make a mistake, and uh, that way you know when you if you make that mistake then you'll know what to do. So just go ahead and click delete. We're gonna delete this whole thing from the clipboard. Oh no, we don't want to save it. We already saved it, so it's deleted it, and we can start fresh now. So we'll go ahead and down here again, click on time lapse, and we'll just start messing around again in the viewport and you can see it's recording. Now I think it might be recording no it's not recording uh, just with the uh, sculpting so. but I believe it's recording less frames because it'll play it back a lot faster aka time-lapse so we'll just play around and do nothing with it Okay. Well, this is going to be a really short time lapse, but let's go ahead and just pause it, and then we'll play it back again. And you can see that went so fast because we probably only we re we only recorded 26 frames. It's 24 frames a second, so um, that was literally one second of video. But uh, let's try to make this a little more interesting. Actually, here we'll go ahead and delete it, no save, and we'll record a time lapse again. And we'll try to get it up to uh, a decent amount this time. Let's just play around for a minute. Let's uh, let's just mess around for a minute. See if we can get a decent time lapse going. Uh, 
uh, too, I'll tell you, time lapses, like I said, they're good for showing off your work. Uh, they're also good for like um, showing portfolio work if you want to uh, maybe put on your resume or something to uh, a YouTube link or something like that. You can guide people to your YouTube site or something like that and uh, let them view your time lapses and stuff, especially if you're uh, really heavily emphasizing your sculpting in your uh, portfolio. People like to see that stuff. Especially if you can get in with the right amount of people. Um, you gotta remember, like, recruiters won't really look at that stuff as much because they have thousands of applications and portfolios fly across their desk every day, but if you network and you get people to watch this stuff and look at your portfolio, then you stand a really good chance of getting your foot in the door. I really have no idea what we're drawing right now, we're just messing around, not doing anything at all. Really just trying to get these frames up so I can show you a little bit better example. And bacon strips, and bacon strips, and bacon strips. So anyway, let's go ahead and just pause it. It's not going to be long at all. It'll probably be like three seconds. But let's go ahead and play it back. And you can see how fast and time-lapse that was. Um, now real quickly, too, obviously you can see there's a ZBrush logo faded over it. Okay, well this is just like an intro logo and an outro logo and you do have the control over it to uh, get rid of that if you so wish. You can also actually uh, put your own logo over it which is also a pretty cool thing. But to get rid of it down here in the title image menu just take your fade in and fade out time to zero and uh, that way it won't show at all. Here in the overlay menu this is the opacity of the image itself and all that. So obviously we're not going to want it. We just want our sculpt to start, our time lapse video to start right away. See? Now we have all that. Very quickly done, obviously, but when you're doing that for an hour, it turns into like a seven minute video. And then that way everybody can see your work in quick succession and still have a really good idea of what you're doing. Okay? So that's pretty much that. That's pretty much all there is to uh, recording a movie pretty simple process. It's actually really simple within ZBrush, so I mean, definitely utilize it if you get the chance to. Alright, so uh, now I'm also going to show you next how to um, use a nifty little plugin uh, with ZBrush called ZApp Link. And um, this has pretty much been with ZBrush since the third iteration, I believe. Um, but like many others, it started out as a plugin, and uh, now it's included by default. But uh, anyway, I've opened up my Abomination model, which is another piece I created. You can also see on my website. And um, as you can see, he's moving around very, very, very slowly. And, and uh, yeah, part of that's my uh, really bad hardware, too. But uh, it doesn't help that he's also about 20 million, or no, he's about 48 million polygons. So uh, way in the high, high, high ranges right now. But, of course, I have every subtool set to a high resolution, I think. So... Uh, that's probably what's bogging it down quite a bit. This would be uh, pretty taxing on most hardware, regardless of what it was. So, um, to save myself some grace, I'm going to go ahead and say all low and set all my subtools to the lowest subdivision. Um, this might take a minute, but uh, it's going to save me a lot of time moving around. So, we'll let it take the time it needs to. Uh, set it downwards but um while it's doing this let me explain with with a z app link basically what that does is it allows you to drop your model uh quote unquote onto your canvas in photoshop 
and uh, it basically becomes an interactive canvas at that point. Um, you can't move the model around or anything, but it allows you to put any images or any kind of other detail you want into play and leave it on that canvas and then it transfers it back into ZBrush and actively projects it onto your model and you can do that in a pretty uh, short set of actions so it, it's pretty useful if you want to do things like tattoos or logos that have very specific shapes to them or something like that something you can't really just paint out or anything like that so it's it's pretty useful actually but um this thing ever gets done then I can show you exactly how that works about halfway I know it ain't gonna take a minute and a half It'd be ridiculous there it's almost done So I apologize for those having to wait on my five year outdated hardware, but it'll get there eventually. Okay, let's see you work your magic ZBrush. So, looks like I got all the tools down to their lowest uh, subdivision level. Some of the ones that are still up high are actually technically at their lowest subdivision level because that's what I last saved them out as. I uh, don't know what I was thinking, but this model was done a long time ago. So, live and learn. Anyway, um, we'll go ahead and move in a little bit closer here. It's still moving pretty slow, but we'll try to rough through it and um, we'll bring this chest plate piece back up just so I can show you an example of how Z app link works bring this back up to a high level Maybe that's too high. We'll see. Two million. It's a tad too high, so I'll just bring it down. It's not going to make a whole lot of difference. So we'll go ahead and zoom in on this chess piece here. And um, we'll just leave it right here. This is fine. Um, you see my whole canvas right here now, right? Okay, well, what I'm going to basically do, like I said, is drop this into Photoshop. And we do that by clicking the Z plugin. Or no, it's actually in the, under the, um, it's under the document now. And um, click Z app link. Now you get this little dialog box. And it says double-sided, fade enable perspective we'll just leave it to the default options okay and uh, over here you have the set target app and when you're using this for the first time you're gonna wanna set your target app to whatever image editor you're using um, I use Photoshop obviously so I already have that set up and everything so I'm not gonna mess with this but if you're doing it for the first time make sure you click that and navigate to the um, executable for your uh, 
for your image editing program. Now, anyway, um, so we're going to click drop now and it's going to drop it into our canvas in Photoshop. Yeah, once it gives it a second to communicate with the program. And there we have it. And dropped it into Photoshop. We have it on our canvas in Photoshop. And um, you can see down here we have our two layers. This is what ZBrush uses to discern the um, the detail you're about to paint in uh, with uh, everything else, with the model itself and everything. So obviously, read the instructions. Do not delete. That's what it says. Do not delete this. Um, do not edit, rather. But same meaning. Don't mess with these because if you do, ZBrush isn't going to know what to do when you re-import it. It's going to freak out. So anyway, you're going to stay on this layer that's not locked. And what I'm also going to do just for to be more careful is create a new layer okay and uh, let's just let's just uh, open up a little ditty we'll open up my uh, we'll open up my company's logo here Okay, so I have my little logo here, and uh, what I'm basically going to do is just drag and drop it onto this right here, and that actually created its own canvas or its own layer rather, and so that's fine too. Um, oh, don't want to edit that. We'll edit the one we just dropped and scale it down. <coughs> And I'm not concerned with the black edges or anything. I'm just, again, showing you an example of how things work. So we'll leave that there. We'll drop it right there, okay? And um, before you finish this and save it out and exit it to uh, go back into ZBrush with it, make sure that you merge this down into layer one, okay? And you can merge it down. It'll say blah, blah, blah. The thing has a mask. And... Um, don't worry about that just go ahead and apply it but this is this is pretty important when you re-import it into ZBrush it's only going to realize the layer one file name on here so it has to be called layer one otherwise it won't recognize it it'll freak out and it'll start asking you a bunch of questions about things that you might not know what's going on so leave it as layer one whatever changes you make merge it down and then if even if it merges down sometimes it'll rename itself as the uppermost layer rename it layer one make sure it's layer one okay so when we're finished we're gonna go ahead and click save and we'll just save this right out okay and then once we jump back into ZBrush it'll say re-enter ZBrush or return the external editor if you haven't finished editing the image then just return to your image editor and finish what you're doing. If you are done editing, which we are, we're going to re-enter ZBrush with it. And now what ZBrush is going to do is it's going to drop this onto the canvas. And now whenever you click pick up now, it's going to project it onto your 3D model. And it's going to paint the, the uh, editing onto it. So you see now we have it on our 3D model. See? So again, like I said, this can be really useful actually if you need to uh, maybe make a precise logo or shape or anything on your model. It's, uh, it's actually really useful. Now uh, this has been elaborated on with uh, Spotlight now. So if you learn how to use Spotlight, you'll also have the same ability. And uh, Spotlight's a little more intuitive about it, but uh, this is still this is still a useful tool. So that's how you use the app link. Okay.
Okay, so the last uh, couple things I want to show you before we finish up this bonus feature is um, firstly, I'm going to be showing you the Subtool Master, which is also another thing that started out as a plugin and is now included by default with the newer versions. So um, if you go down here under Z Plugin and uh, you click on Subtool Master, the menu, and then click on the button, it's going to open up this little guy right here. Okay. Now, uh, obviously, this is a single subtool, so it's useless right now. Um, this is going to be useful when you're creating and managing multiple subtools. Um, I suppose if you really wanted to, you could mirror this, but it's going to mirror over itself or whatever anyway. So let's uh, do it with something a little more practical. Let's open up the um, let's open up the demo soldier. Cause he's got a lot of subtools on him. Okay, so we'll uh, go ahead and open up the Subtool Master again. Again, Z plugin, Subtool Master menu, Subtool Master. And um, when we get this little menu opening up here, we have a few different options to play around with, and some of these are really useful. Um, Multi append is pretty useful because if you have other objects outside of ZBrush that you want to import, uh, typically, you would have to come over here and click import and in import them all individually, basically. Well, with Subtool Master, it gives you the option to import multiple objects at once onto your um, onto your tool. So, this is extremely useful if you have a character with a lot of armor or uh, anything else, just a lot of different pieces to them you can import all these at the same time and so it's super useful instead of the tedious process of going through and importing each one individually um, let's see if I can find an example here these are not going to fit the uh, demo soldier at, our, cause, at all because they're not positioned properly but let's try and open up my OBJs and then just uh, let's just open a few of these um, armband, gauntlet, gauntlet attachments, whatever. But you can see I'm selecting multiple uh, things at once here, which is uh, a good thing. And then once you just open that, it'll import all of them into your scene, and it will place them all automatically too. It doesn't. It doesn't have to go through the process of putting it in here and then you going down here and appending all of them. You can see these four things I just imported. They're all here. They're in my menu already, and ready to be used. So that's very useful. Like I said, if you have uh, something with a lot of pieces to it, now you go back up and go ahead. Go back in the Subtool Master. We also have uh, a couple other options like Mirror and Merge. Um, these are pretty good options to use if you're in ZBrush and you just want to merge some things together, maybe to condense them or optimize them uh, when you export them. Because, like uh, a good example would be a good example would be like, say, for instance, I want the uh, backpack in the shoulder pad, or the yeah, the backpack in the shoulder pad here. Um, maybe I'm going to bake these into one mesh or something. So instead of like separating them and exporting them individually to um, to bake them down to each individual low poly mesh of, of whatever they're corresponding to, I can open up both of them here. Maybe we'll also do the belt since it's far enough away. We can uh, have a pretty practical way of baking these down. Um, open up Subtool Master and we'll go ahead and just click on merge and it pretty much merges all the visible ones together um, you can merge this into um, and you can delete all the extra subtools if you want to preserve your existing polygroups of course you can do that too we'll just leave merge only on and we'll click OK and actually it just went ahead and merged everything didn't it Oh no, it didn't. It left. Uh, it actually, what it did, it just went through the entire list and uh, made sure that everything else was going to stay by itself. 
but when you uh, merge it together, it creates a new subtool within your uh, palette here. Now it's going to leave the existing ones alone. We can always go back and delete these if we really need to, but um, you can also just you can either delete those or you can leave those there and uh, have the rest of your model work with the uh, new subtool that you created. So now we have the new merge subtool. We turn these ones off. And here we have the merged one down here. So it has its uses. And also uh, take note that when you merge your your uh, tools together, the ones that you wanted to merge together, it creates a new tool also in this uh, in your tool palette. So you have that for exportation, if you uh, so please. Okay, another uh, thing you can do actually, and here's the advantage of having those tools stay separate. We'll go ahead and delete our merged one from there. Is you can uh, you can mirror these over. Now you can do this anyway within your uh, subtool menu, but I personally think Subtool Master makes it a little bit easier because all you do is open up Subtool Master and um, with your object selected that you want to mirror, which we got this shoulder pad right here, we're we'll going to mirror that. Just click on mirror and it opens up this menu right here. Well, you want to mirror across which axis which axis, um, x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, okay? It doesn't matter, really, but obviously for this practical application, we're going to merge it across the x-axis, so it goes on to other shoulder. And um, up here, you also have the option to merge it into one subtool. You're going to be merging these two into one subtool, or you can append it as a new subtool. So when it mirrors the uh, tool, it'll create another tool for this shoulder pad. So we'll go ahead and merge them as one. So we have one subtool to play with here. And click OK, let it do its magic, and bam, right there. And we have a, a subtool mirrored over. Now, uh, when you're doing this too, keep in mind you want to pay attention to the floor, or rather the axis itself, to make sure that whatever you're mirroring across is going to mirror across symmetrically if you want it to be that way. If you don't want it to be that way, then, then that's fine. You can mirror it however you like, but most of the time you're going to want to mirror it symmetrically. So if you mirror it, make sure that your pivot is on the center axis that it's going to be mirroring across. Okay. So that's a really cool thing to have uh, in your arsenal. There's a lot of other options here. They all do various things, but these are going to be the three main ones you're you're going to be using a lot in your workflow. Okay, and uh, moving on, the very last thing I want to show you is um, the pose tool, transpose more, more or less, rather. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll just start deleting all of these tools just so we have the body left over. Okay, you see we have the body here. Not there. Anyway, to um, give your guy maybe like a quick pose or something, it, there's a lot more to it than this, but I'm going to show you the basic function of transpose. Um, the easy way to do it is to click on either move, rotate, or scale, whichever you're going to be move, rotating, or scale moving um, and then you're going to drag this guy out right here once you have one of these selected okay and you'll be able to manipulate it post doing this also so you can uh, what you basically do is you select whatever you want and you drag out your action line and once you drag out your action line decide uh, if you want symmetry on to you can press X and turn symmetry on for that uh, we're going to go ahead and click on the rotate right here and whenever you have your action line drawn out across how you're going to want to manipulate it then you can just start messing with them okay well you see what's happening right now right he's stretching out and it looks like crap 
looks like a mutating monster or whatever. But obviously we don't want this. And the reason this is happening is because we don't have the area that we're manipulating masked off. So let's undo all the way back there. And um, what you need to do is mask off the arm area because we want to manipulate the arm area. We don't want to manipulate the rest of the body. And you can do that by holding control and clicking across, dragging your action line out however far you want to mask it off. Uh, we can mask it off all the way down to the wrist, maybe if we want to rotate the hand or something, or we can mask it off up to the elbow, or yeah, up to the elbow. And uh, if we want to rotate the forearm, but we're gonna go ahead and mask it off up here in the shoulder and collarbone area. And you see it automatically softens that because it's assuming you're gonna be moving the arm. You want a smooth transition from the uh, arm into the back and, and chest when it's uh, when you're posing it. So uh, before you do that, just quickly check to make sure like sometimes if you if you do it like this or something and uh, you may not notice but there might be another mask off part down here and it might end up manipulating that giving you something you really don't want. Uh, so just make sure the area that you want to manipulate is, is free of masking. And once you have it masked off, you can just draw your action line again. Let's see, let's get a little more accurate from here to here. And once you have that done, you can just click on whatever area you're planning on rotating and just rotate it. And you can see obviously we have a little problem up there in the traps, but we're not going to worry too much about that because uh, I'm just showing you how it's done really. If you wanted to make sure that doesn't happen, let's demask him and let's bring that mask up here a little bit more so it doesn't really affect past his shoulder area. See, now we have that. Well, you're going to get some bad deformation sometimes, but that's something you just have to work around. You can you can uh, combat this a couple different ways. You can you can uh, custom mask off this area if you really wish. Let's bring him back. Like if you wanted to, you could click on the um, draw again and go back and you can demask this area and then maybe blur it so it has a smoother transition. It's not always going to be perfect, but you just have to mess around with it as much as you can until you get the desirable result. So that's a little bit better. You do that, and uh, you'll have to redraw your action line whenever you position them anew. Uh, we can rotate the uh, arm in. We don't want it like that, of course. We want local symmetry. And we can rotate shoulder pads a little bit I'm not sure how we're trying to pose this guy I'm just doing a little ditty Who bends that way, but <laughs> we're just having fun right now. Now, what I often do when I'm posing my characters is I will actually uh, finish posing them this way, and then what I'll sometimes go back and do is sculpt in some of the deformation a little bit so that it matches the pose itself a little bit more. It doesn't look so uh, muddy or just awfully deformed. So that gives you a good idea of how to pose them with your transpose tool. Uh, much like uh, the rotate, you can also you can also just uh, move them around. It's going to probably give you 
less desirable results because you're just moving it around you're not you're not uh, doing any practical deformation or anything got a little bit of an artifact there but we won't worry about that for the sake of example and of course you can do the same thing with scale you can just scale these things however you like but uh, if you master this it's uh, it's pretty useful actually you can you can take your character when he's finished and just give them give them this really cool action pose or something or just really scary pose or whatever like this one's kind of scary because he's like a fat blob coming at you but <laughs> that's pretty much uh, all there is to transpose it's a uh, pretty useful tool like I said there is also um, a different way you can pose him you can use your Z spheres to rig him up that's a little bit more uh, it's not complicated but it's a little more time consuming so if you want to learn how to do that there's plenty of resources out there on how to find find out how to do that so uh, with that I'm gonna go ahead and in this bonus feature and I uh, hope you enjoyed the entire series if you watched it and uh, I hope you enjoyed these bonus features please check out my website www.richcg.com and uh, my company's website adaptiveelite.com and uh, I'll see you guys next time thank you